Okay, greetings, Biology 107 students. I hope you're doing well. Right now, we're going to continue with topic 15. We already did the first half of this lecture in class, and so I'm continuing basically where we left off. We already talked about genomes and genes and defined a few things around that with some historical experiments. So now we're going to talk about uh, mostly transcription and translation and some various definitions that will help you with the next couple of topics, topics 16 and 17, which are in. So first, just as a review, what is a gene? These are some of the things we discussed. We discussed a gene as being a unit of inheritance. So meaning, you know, we have green peas or yellow peas. Maybe you got blue eyes from one of your parents or brown hair or whatever. Uh, more specifically, we're talking about now, uh, a little bit more chemically, we're talking about specific nucleotide sequences, sequences that code for something. So what do they code for? They can code for a protein, they can code for an enzyme, they don't have to code for a protein product, they can code for an RNA product, such as ribosomal RNA or transfer RNA. Uh, so that's what a gene is. So in summary, you can see basically we're looking at a region of DNA, and that's mostly how we're going to be talking about a gene in this class for the rest of the semester. So if you think about genes and if they're coding for proteins, what we want to talk about now is how you do that, how you go from nucleic acids to amino acids. It's kind of like going from one language to another. So take a look at this image. We are going to be talking about these things, and these are the most important things for you to learn for the final exam. We've already discussed replication in detail. Six proteins and enzymes, know them. Transcription, we're going to be talking about in topic 16 in detail. Know this. Topic 17 is translation. We're going to be talking about it in detail. So make sure you know these things for the final exam. If you need to learn anything for the final exam, it's these three concepts, inside and out. It's going to make up a huge part of the final exam. I cannot emphasize it enough. So these processes, if you're a bacteria, there's only one place for it to happen. That's the cytoplasm. Replication, transcription, and translation are all going to occur in the cytoplasm, sometimes somewhat simultaneously. So if you're eukaryote, what you're going to do is uh, all your DNA processes are going to happen in the nucleus. So DNA gets replicated in the nucleus. It does not leave the nucleus, except for during mitosis, of course. Uh, transcription, the production of RNA, happens in the nucleus because it needs the DNA as a template. After that, the RNA is going to leave the nucleus. So here it goes, out through nuclear pore. And then it's going to find a ribosome. Some genes are going to make soluble proteins. So these are going to be free, soluble ribosomes, and that's all going to happen in the cytoplasm. Uh, other genes are going to code for RNAs that are going to uh, ultimately be attached to bound ribosomes, bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, RER, rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the translation in this case is going to happen at the ER, and this is going to be for endomembrane proteins, so proteins going to other organelles in the endomembrane system, or also exported or secreted proteins. So step one, we want to talk about transcription. So this is like scribing. You're going from a nucleotide to a nucleotide. So it's kind of like copying. Uh, if you take a look at the bottom here, the only difference is you probably know that RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. And anywhere where we have a T, that's going to get converted to a U. All the other nucleotides are fine, so G copy to a G, G copy to a G, and so on, except for wherever we have a T, it's copied to a U for uracil. This is done by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. We will talk about it in detail in the next unit. Step two is translation. We're going from one language to another, nucleotides to amino acids. This happens at the ribosome, of course. We talked about ribosomes, more on them later. So here was the question. We're talking about after Watson and Crick, so late 1950s, how was this done? How do we go from nucleotides to amino acids? So believe it or not, Watson and Crick, so here's Watson here. Down in the right corner, this is Watson, W for Watson. Then here's Crick over here. 
uh, they became part of a very exclusive group of scientists called the RNA Tie Club. Yes, imagine that. Those are pretty cool ties. Let me know if you can find one for me. I'd love to have one. So you can see here, um, Watson was tyrosine. Crick was proline. Maybe you can guess how many members were in this exclusive club. That's right, 20. 20 amino acids, 20 members in this exclusive club. Although they did have four honorary members. Why four? That's right, four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C. Anyway, this club, they were working on this riddle. How can you get from nucleotides to amino acids? So here is the thought. Nucleotide, one nucleotide per amino acid doesn't work. We only have four nucleotides and 20 amino acids. That's not going to work. So what if we have two nucleotides equaling, equaling one amino acid? That's not going to work either because there's only 16 actual poss uh, possible uh, combinations of, of nucleotides. So they figured it must be three. It must be three nucleotides is going to code for one amino acid. That actually gives us 64 possibilities, but that's certainly more than 20, which is all we need. So believe it or not, Marshall Nuremberg was the guy who saw, cracked this code, and he was not part of the RNA tie club. So interesting. So what did he do? Uh, pretty simple experiment, actually. He made, uh, synthetically, he made a, basically a strand of uracils, so a strand of nucleotides, all the same one. Uh, he synthesized this, and you throw it in a, in a test tube with a yeast extract. So in this yeast extract is basically all the yeast cyto, uh, cytoplasmic components. So you can imagine in a cytoplasm, you've got ATP, you've got solutes, you've got transfer RNAs, uh, you've got ribosomes, and this is what was needed for translation. So here he goes, he sticks it in the test tube, you've got all those U's, and then what did he find? Well, he found a whole bunch of phenylalanines. So P-H-E, that is the amino acid phenylalanine. Uh, so he had a string of those. So the conclusion was that UUU codes for phenylalanine, and he was right. There's Nuremberg there. Uh, he did a few more experiments. He found that AAA codes for lysine, CCC for proline, GGG codes for glycine. And then after that, you could imagine the puzzle gets a little bit more complicated, but it's doable. You start di trying different combinations and see if you can tease out uh, what amino acids you're getting. Uh, and so the genetic code was cracked. So here's the genetic code. Uh, you've probably seen something like this before. Uh, there's 64 uh, triplets of nucleotides. Those triplets are called codons. And uh, you can see there's a whole bunch of them there. So if you take a look in the top left, there's phenylalanine, triple U, and also UUC codes for phenylalanine. So it has actually two codons that code for it. Uh, I want to point out a few special codons in particular. So down here, AUG. This is the most important codon for you to know. Uh, this codes for the amino acid methionine, MET, but also is the start codon. So every single gene starts with AUG, starts with the start codon. This is the starting place. This is how the ribosome knows this is where to begin to start making amino acids. There are also stop codons. So over here up in the, in the right, oops, over here we have these stop codons. So A or UAA, UAG and UGA. These are the stop codons that tells the ribosome to stop. Something else to point out is the code is degenerate. So what that means is that you have multiple codons coding for one amino acid. So you can see here we have four that code for proline. If we look at something like um, isoleucine, it has three codons. Phenylalanine has two, and so on. Another thing about this code is, is it pretty much it's universal amongst all organisms. So what's true for E. coli is true for elephants and humans and plants. And uh, so if you have one gene from one organism, another organism can actually make the exact same protein. So we'll talk about that later. So here's the ribosome. Much more on ribosomes later. We talked about ribosomes. There's different ones for eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Eukaryotes have 80S ribosomes. 
prokaryotes have 70 S ribosomes. There are two subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit. You can see there's the messenger RNA in red right here. Uh, this little thing here is supposed to be a transfer RNA. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And then you can have, uh, you can see these purple amino acids are being strung together to make a protein sequence. So here's what a transfer RNA looks like, or at least it look, what it would look like if it was flattened. It's made out of RNA, has a five prime end and a three prime end. You can see there are some double stranded uh, portions, which is represented, you can see right here, represented by these uh, dotted lines. Those are hydrogen bonds. There's two important things to know about the transfer RNA. One is that it has an amino acid attached to it. So there are 20 amino acids, so there are actually more than 20 transfer RNAs. Uh, at, you need at least one for each amino acid. Uh, the other thing is the anticodon. So this is the adapter. This is where the conversion, the translation occurs. The anticodon is going to recognize the codon on the messenger RNA. Let's take a look. So right here you can see we have a codon, A, G, U. So if I look at my genetic code, uh, A, G, U codes for serine right here. And uh, you can see there's a serine attached to that transfer RNA. The anticodon is going to be complementary and antiparallel. So you can see it's U, C, A, and it's going to recognize that codon. So like I said, a transfer RNA is really just an adapter that brings the right amino acid to the ribosome as coded for on the messenger RNA. So more on translation later in topic uh, 17, I believe. So here's a, a sample which we're going to try. Uh, by the way, you are going to do something like this on the final exam, so it's important that you understand how to do this. This isn't the complete question yet. There's still a few more things for us to learn. But we're going to try this. We're going to do the transcription, and we're going to do the translation. So what you're looking at there is a DNA sequence. It's double-stranded. And uh, you're going to code for the messenger RNA first. So messenger RNA, I'm going to put it down there in a moment. Uh, so we're going to talk about this, this later, uh, but the first thing that you need to, to, uh, to look for is the start codon. So here's the start codon here, ATG. So remember the start codon is actually AUG on the genetic code, but this is DNA, so we've got to recognize ATG. I know some of you are looking, and maybe you see this here, ATG. That is not ATG. Remember, in DNA, we read it 5 prime to 3 prime, so this is actually G, T, A. So look for the start codon. The start codon is always 5 prime, A, T, G, to 3 prime. So what we're going to do, uh, you can see my hint over here. It says use, this is the template strand. So what that means is that the enzyme, RNA polymerase, looks at this template strand, so it sees a T. Wherever it sees a T, it's going to put an A. And then it sees an A, and wherever it sees an A, it's going to put a U. Remember, we're making RNA. And where it sees a C, it's going to put a G. So here we go. 5 prime A, U, G. So this matches the template strand, or it's complementary to the template strand. So notice the other strand, it's almost identical. A, T, G gets converted to A, U, G. So usually what I do is I just look at the strand with the start code on, and I copy it, except for I turn all my T's into U's. So for example, CCG becomes CCG. TAC becomes UAC. TTC becomes UCU. ATC becomes AUC. CTA becomes CUA. And TAA becomes UAA. So there you go. There's a mark for you on your final exam if you can do that. Uh, like I said, we'll be looking at more examples of this. They're going to be a little bit more complex as we learn more things. The next thing is to give the amino acid sequence. So usually what I do is I underline all my codons. I start with the start codon and underline all the triplets. And then it's a lot easier for me to look at these and then compare to the genetic code. So let's do the protein sequence. So AUG, hopefully you know that one already, AUG is methionine. So you can use the three-letter code, uh, whatever you see on the genetic code. CCG, so I'm going to look up here on, on that list. And where is it? 
uh, here we go, CCG is right there, and so we are looking at proline. So we'll throw down proline. We can keep reading the genetic code, UAC. So UAC, where is it? UAC is right here. Tyrosine, so I'll put that down. Finish the rest, serine, isoleucine, and leucine. So notice UAA. Let's take a look at that. Go up to your genetic code, UAA. That is a stop codon. So there's no amino acid named stop. So I don't need to write stop. Okay, this is just the stop codon. I'm actually already done. So no need to write stop. I won't penalize you on the final exam if you do write stop, but it is certainly not necessary. So stay tuned for more of these examples. So remember this, replication, transcription, translation. Know these, know them in detail. We're going to cover lots of details on transcription and translation in the next couple of units. So a couple more final notes. You can see how this note here, one gene is one protein. This applies to all living things. This has actually practical applications when we're looking at uh, bio, uh, biotechnology and genetic engineering. So here's a couple of examples. Here on the right, you can see we have humulin. This is human insulin. It's made in E. coli. So we can take the human gene for insulin and we can put it in E. coli. This is great. We get cheap insulin, and E. coli does it for us. This is because the genetic code for E. coli is the same as the genetic code for humans. Uh, on the left, this is some other examples of just some enzymes, so lipase and protease that are made by genetic engineering. They're produced in large quantities and put in uh, various uh, laundry detergents. Here's a couple other examples of some things that have been done with genetic engineering. These are examples from the textbook. People aren't just trying to make weird pigs or tobacco plants. The whole idea here is a proof of principle. It's very easy to see this kind of phenotype. Uh, so they make these colored phenotypes first before they start doing things that are practical. Uh, they're interesting. I feel sorry for the pig. But uh, anyway, uh, like I said, some examples from your textbook. We are going to be talking about more examples of biotechnology in Topic 19. Here's one example I wanted to share with you now. This is a pretty cool example. This is a glowfish. So what the scientists here did was they took the uh, genes from uh, uh, fluorescent genes from jellyfish and they put them in aquarium fish. And you can buy these. Actually, you can buy them in the United States. I don't think we can buy them in Canada yet. But if we could, I would certainly go buy some. They are very cool. Okay, so that concludes topic 15. Uh, you can go over these concepts on your own time, download the PowerPoint. Uh, don't forget to review all the material. Like I said, we are going to be covering these in more detail, uh, transcription and translation, in the next couple of units. Uh, don't forget to go over the study questions, and uh, I will try to prepare you the best I can for the final exam. Always send me questions by email, and I will answer them as soon as I can. Have a great day.